uh, a federal government resource manage management agency was being accused by the public of promoting what was deemed to be a risky technology. A PhD level biologist who had risen to a top management position in the agency was convinced by the evidence that the risk allocated with the technology was in fact low. In apparent exasperation, he responded to the public criticism of his agency's decision making with the question, why doesn't anybody believe us anymore? Addressing this phenomenon of rising skepticism, lack of trust, controversy, and even overt conflict in American society regarding issues surrounding public health and environmental safety. Our speaker for today recently wrote, quote, during a 20 year period in which our society has grown healthier and safer on average and spent billions of dollars and immense effort to become so, the American public has become more rather than less concerned about risk. We have come to perceive ourselves as more vulnerable, vulnerable to risk and to believe that the land, air, and water are more seriously contaminated by toxic substances than ever before." Close quote. Dr. Paul Slovak is with us today to expand on this statement of his and related matters. Dr. Slovak has a long and distinguished involvement in risk analysis and public policy matters. Uh, in 1972, for example, 20 years ago, uh, he was a consultant to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission's Task Force on Risk and Public Response. Uh, our speaker holds a BA from Stanford and an MA and PhD from the University of Michigan, all in psychology. He is a former Fulbright Scholar and the recipient of several other academic awards. He is a member of numerous honorary and professional societies, and I note in particular that he is past president and a fellow of the Society for Risk Analysis. Uh, during the last 20 years, he has been a consultant to or served on task forces and committees of such organizations as the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, as mentioned, uh, but also the U.S. Program for Man and the Biosphere, the National Academy of Sciences, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the National Safety Council, and the World Health Organization. Uh, since 1986, Dr. Slovak has been both president of Decision Research uh, in Eugene and professor, professor of psychology at the University of Oregon. To share with us his perspectives on the topic perceived risk, trust, and politics, I'm pleased to present Dr. Paul Slovak. Thank you very much. I appreciate that nice introduction. I'm pleased to be here today to talk about the perception of risk and all of these. Uh, uh, conflicts that surround risk, risk issues. Uh, you'll have to excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold uh, uh, this morning, uh, picked up by doing some rather irrational things last weekend, which I won't go into. Uh, be I thought I'd start by talking a bit about how a psychologist gets into this business of, of risk perception and, uh, and uh, public, uh, public concerns, because it isn't uh, an area that many, uh, many behavioral scientists are working in right now. And the uh, way I got into this business of, of risk was actually, uh, appropriately enough, by, by chance. As a graduate student at the University of Michigan, I was assigned to be a research assistant to a professor named Clyde Coombs, who uh, was interested in decision making uh, having to do with risk. And he took very seriously the adage that life is a gamble. So he started a research program in which he had people make decisions about pure gambles. And it wasn't that he was interested in gambling, per se, but he was interested in how people deal with the conflicts that, that risk poses for us. That is, the conflict between uh, trying to get something that we want, some gain, uh, and at the same time, uh, thinking about what the probability is that we'll succeed, uh, thinking about what the probability is that we'll fail, and what the cost is if we'll fail. So with gambles, you can do a lot of nice experimental studies in a laboratory setting where you kind of change the probabilities of, of winning and losing and change the payoffs and watch how people respond and see if you can sort people into people who are, who are kind of aggressive <coughs> risk takers who go after uh, low probability, high payoff uh, uh, prospects and others who are very cautious and are always looking at what, what the chance of losing is, trying to minimize the chance of loss or the amount to loss. Uh, to lose. And 
uh, that's uh, sort of the enterprise that uh, a few researchers uh, uh, do when they're looking at choices among gambles. Uh, I thought that was more interesting than, than some of the other things I came to study in psychology, and, and I started doing the same thing myself. And uh, uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, we learned a few things. Uh, first of all, we learned that it's hard for people to think about risk, that making these trade-offs between uh, chances of gain and chances of loss and, uh, and, and the amounts that you're going to win or lose is a very painful process for people. Uh, we try to avoid thinking about life as a gamble, and we sort of try to hide the uncertainties whenever possible because it is so difficult. We also found that there's no general risk-taking uh, personality, that uh, most people uh, are very differential in the way they respond to risk. Uh, a person may be very cautious in the way they manage their money and yet be very reckless you know, in the way they, they, uh, they drive their car or their, their uh, their motorboat or something like that. So risk tends to be very, very differential across activities uh, for most people. We also found that uh, something called framing is very important. And that's the way the, the, uh, the, the risk decision is, is posed to a person. So for example, if a person is thinking about a uh, surgery versus radiation therapy uh, for, a, uh, <coughs> for say lung cancer, uh, the physician can pose this as a, as a gamble. Uh, surgery has uh, some immediate chance of mortality on the operating table, but if you survive the operation, you usually have a longer life expectancy. Radiation therapy doesn't have that immediate uh, risk of death, but it doesn't do as well in the long run. So it's, a, it's quite a difficult uh, uh, decision in, in that case. And what was found in some of these studies is that if you, if you present people the uh, statistics of this gamble in terms of survival rates, uh, you get a very different response in terms of which they choose than if you present it in terms of mortality rates. Uh, the fact that uh, surgery has a 10% uh, mortality rate and radiation therapy has 0% is very powerful uh, if you're talking about mortality rates. If you switch that and talk about 90% survival versus 100% survival, that difference doesn't appear as large to people, and they're more willing to, uh, to, uh, to go with the surgery. So very subtle factors affect the way we respond to, to risk in these situations. After a few years of studying gambles, uh, we decided that we needed to get away from the, the college campus and, and uh, try to, to uh, look at, at risks that people took with larger amounts of gambles, bigger gambles. And we were fortunate to get a chance to go to uh, Las Vegas and set up an experiment on the floor of the Four Queens Casino. Uh, this was 1969. It was just a pure fluke that we got this opportunity because uh, uh, casino managers don't usually allow uh, academics to, to uh, take up valuable space on their floor. <coughs> so we set up a, uh, a roulette wheel and a computer and we, st we started to, to try to uh, play these gambling games with people down there. And that was a rather uh, 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 big flop actually, uh, because what we found is that uh, the people down there really don't like to think about, about the risk and the gambling. When you, when you go down there, you go down there to have fun or to, uh, you kind of turn, you want to turn your mind off, and there's a lot of habitual uh, uh, behavior, uh, which it doesn't involve hard thinking about, you know, risks and benefits, and as a result, people uh, didn't like the games we were proposing for them to play, even though they were fair games, you know, no house advantage. Uh, people didn't like to play them. So we were rather um, uh, dismayed about that and, and went back to our laboratory. And we probably would have stayed there doing these little studies on gambles uh, forever if it hadn't been that we were fortunate enough to have attracted the attention of a, of a well-known geographer named Gilbert White, who had spent his career uh, thinking about how people uh, behave in the face of natural disasters like floods and earthquakes. And he had heard we were studying risk and came up to Eugene to, to visit us. And he had a lot of questions for us, uh, such as, um, why is it that, uh, that people uh, you know, are worried about living near a nuclear reactor, but they, they really couldn't care less about you know, uh, living on a floodplain? And they really uh, don't worry as much as they should about living in an earthquake zone. And when an <coughs> earthquake or a flood occurs, uh, after the uh, damage is cleaned up, they always, you know, rebuild on the same site and, you know, really uh, are very casual about it. 
Uh, he had a lot of questions like that, none of which we could answer on the basis of our previous studies of gambling. And that was a bit embarrassing, but it was also intriguing. So we started to, to work with him a bit on perception of risk from natural hazards. And this was in the 70s, and the environmental movement started to pick up, and it wasn't long before we got dragged into looking at issues of nuclear power and, and chemicals and all the rest, and uh, that sort of sealed our fate, and we went on this course now of looking at the what we call societal risk-taking, which really cuts across uh, a wide range of, of hazards, trying to understand uh, how people think about these risks and what that means for, uh, for our society. Now, when we go outside the laboratory and start looking at these, at these risks, I think we can best characterize the issue of risk perception uh, as a battleground. Uh, it's a battleground marked by very strong and conflicting views about the nature and seriousness of the, uh, of the risks of, of modern life. And it was, as was mentioned in the introduction, the, the paradox that intrigues many of us who study this is that as we have become healthier and safer on average, uh, over, over time, and as indeed we have spent billions of dollars and an immense amount of effort to make ourselves healthier and safer, uh, we have at the same time as a society become more concerned about risk. We feel more vulnerable to uh, all sorts of, of hazards and uh, believe that the land, air, and water is more contaminated than ever before. Uh, <clears throat> uh, an example of, of the, uh, the perceptions and attitudes uh, that people hold uh, uh, comes from the fact that if you ask people whether there is more, less, or about the same amount of risk today than there was 20 years ago, say from chemicals, uh, about 80% of the public will say that there's more risk today uh, from chemicals. At the same time, if you ask them the same question about another type of chemical that uh, they come in contact with very frequently and which has some rather serious uh, potential hazards, namely uh, prescription medicines, they have a very different reaction to that. They don't have anywhere near the concern about medicines as a class of chemicals as they do about the generic uh, uh, class of chemical products. And I'll get back to that, uh, this inconsistency in a minute. <coughs> Another way to get a sense of public, uh, public perceptions is to, is to uh, go back to psychology's earliest days and, and use a word association test, as we've done in a lot of situations. So, for example, suppose I ask you to, to th you know, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word chemicals? Stop and think for a second. This is the first thing that comes to mind, chemicals. Well, I probably biased you already because we've been talking about risk, but it, it's, it's sort of amazing that uh, the degree to which the dominant reaction that people have to the word chemicals is the word danger danger or some synonym like uh, uh, deadly or uh, 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 poison, toxic, uh, Bhopal, uh, so forth. The, uh, the terms relating to benefits uh, rarely appear, or at least they're much lower in the hierarchy of our associations. And it's also interesting and in related to this kind of perception that, uh, that about 75% uh, of the public will agree with this statement uh, to the effect that they do everything they can to avoid contact with chemicals and chemical products in their daily life. Now, we get this response. We don't fully know what they, what they mean by that since chemicals are, are everywhere in our environment and, and uh, uh, we really can't avoid them or should we want to avoid them. But this is kind of the reaction that, uh, that exists today uh, that, that is very, uh, very puzzling. A political scientist named <coughs> Aaron Weldofsky wrote about this, uh, this type of concern a few years ago, uh, and let me uh, quote from Weldofsky. He said, uh, how extraordinary, the richest, longest lived, best protected, most resourceful civilization with the highest degree of insight into its own technology is on, the, on its way to becoming the most frightened. Chicken Little is alive and well in America. Is it our environment or ourselves that have changed? Would people like us have had this sort of concern in the past? Today there are risks from numerous small dams, far exceeding those from nuclear reactors. Why is the one feared and not the other? Is it just that we are used to the old, 
or are some of us looking differently at the essentially the same sorts of experience? Well, these are the kind of questions that we've tried to address in our, our research on, on, uh, on risk perception. <coughs> uh, I should add one other, other thing about these concerns, and that is uh, there's a lot of hostility towards, towards the public uh, perceptions uh, of this kind. Uh, uh, I don't agree with the following uh, uh, quotes from Elizabeth Whalen, uh, who's uh, uh, the director of the American Council on Science and Health, but I, I'll quote them to give you an example of the hostility that is born towards a member of the public, members of the public for their, their uh, concerns about chemicals, radiation, and other technological hazards. Uh, Whalen says that our public health priorities in the U.S. are inverted and confused. Uh, that as a nation in pursuit of good health, we are squishing ants and letting the elephants run wild. She says that I believe that the growing fear of technology and the associated regulatory effort to purge our land of hypothetical risks at any cost uh, is economic suicide. And by that she means uh, it's wasteful and unprincipled to chase after chemical residues in our food when cigarettes, AIDS, alcohol, and drug abuse are costing hundreds of thousands of lives, billions upon billions of dollars, and untold human suffering. Well, it's a very strong uh, uh, indictment of public response as leading us uh, astray uh, and, uh, and harming us. A lot of people share that view. Uh, my own view on the basis of the research that we've, we've done is that it's not that simple. Uh, there is wisdom and foolishness uh, on, among all parties. On, you know, there are, are limitations in the scientific study of risk. Uh, there are uh, certainly uh, limitations in the public knowledge and, and attitudes. But the, but the real picture is, uh, is much more complicated. And uh, as I say, there's wisdom and foolishness on both sides of the street. What do I mean by this? <coughs> well, if we... If we look at the way that people perceive risk and the way that experts perceive uh, judge risks, we find that they're very, uh, very different uh, approaches. Uh, to the expert uh, uh, who studies risk, risk is a function of the probability that something bad is going to happen and how bad it's going to be if it does happen. You know, uh, how many lives will be lost or how many people will be injured, how much property will be damaged. So you, and you may want to multiply, multiply the, the severity of the accident or the problem by the probability to get some, some ex expected loss. Uh, that statistical quantitative view is dominant in the, in the technical assessment of risk. It's not dominant in the way that the public thinks about risk. Uh, they're not insensitive to things like probabilities and, and severity, but uh, the public uh, from our studies uh, is much more sensitive to what we would call qualities of, of risks. Uh, things like whether or not uh, you're, one is exposed voluntarily or involuntarily to the hazard. If it's uh, a voluntary risk, we're much more tolerant uh, of, of, uh, of, of risk than if it's imposed upon us. Uh, also, we, people are very sensitive to whether or not they think the experts really know and understand uh, what the risks are. And when risks are judged to be unknown, both to scientists and also to the people who get exposed, then, then the public sees them as more serious and, and less acceptable. Another quality that people take into account that is left out of these quantitative models is equity or fairness in the way risks and benefits uh, are distributed. And so, for example, if you drive your car, that's a very equitable risk because you're you're taking the risk and you're getting the benefit of the transportation. If uh, someone decides to, to site a hazardous waste uh, uh, facility near your, near your home, uh, you may see that as less equitable. Uh, you may feel that uh, you're taking some risk uh, and not really gaining the, the major benefit from that facility. That would be a less equitable type of, of arrangement. So people are very sensitive to these qualities. They're also sensitive to, to something we just call a, a, a general dread that, it, that is associated with some hazards and, and not others. For some reason, we don't dread uh, falls, even though falls are a major uh, cause of death and, and injury uh, in the United States, uh, particularly among the elderly. Uh, 
Uh, we don't dread motor vehicle accidents, another thing that uh, is a, often a serious risk. Uh, we do dread exposure to chemicals and radiation. And uh, a sociologist named Kai Erickson was trying to figure that out, and he concluded that, uh, that uh, in part, people who have been exposed to radiation or chemicals are, are uh, bothered greatly by it because they feel they've been contaminated in some, some deep and lasting way. Uh, they said like having a time bomb ticking within you. And you don't get that reaction to kind of uh, you know, injuries due to, to falls or collisions. Uh, that may or may not be uh, you know, considered rational, but that's the way people feel emotionally about, about these hazards. Another thing that we find in looking at perceptions of risk in our surveys is that, again, there are no generalizable, real strong generalizable uh, perceptions about things like radiation. Sometimes we hear that, you know, well, radiation is always uh, feared, but it's not the case. It, uh, we don't like radiation if it's associated with a nuclear reactor or a nuclear waste site. But uh, we're rather cavalier about uh, getting, uh, getting x-rays uh, uh, if we think we, uh, we'll, we can benefit from that x-ray. Uh, we're also rather unconcerned about uh, radon gas in the home, which is another form of radiation that has been uh, uh, pointed out as, as a potentially serious kind of risk. So if it's from industry, um, such as the nuclear industry, we don't like it. If it's from a medical source, uh, we don't mind it at all. The same thing happens with chemicals, uh, exactly the same dichotomy. If, it's, if the source of exposure is from industry, as in some sort of you know, a chemical plant or, or um, product or a pesticide, uh, we don't like it. And we have very low acceptance uh, of, of risk. If it's from medicine, as in prescription drugs, uh, we're very tolerant uh, of, of risk. And I think that this difference between industrial risks and medical risks uh, can be linked uh, the perception and acceptance can be linked to three factors. First is the perception of benefit. We have rather low percep perception of benefit for things like nuclear power and for most chemical products, except maybe for gasoline and a few others, but we tend to under undervalue the benefits. Uh, also, familiarity uh, is, is very important. Uh, we're very familiar with the medical uses of chemicals and radiation and less familiar with what goes on in a nuclear plant or a chemical plant. And the, uh, uh, the third factor is one of trust. We have more trust in, in the medical profession than in, uh, than in industry. So I think this kind of gives a little hint at the complexity of perceptions and the fact that whether you agree with them or not, there is a logic there to them. And uh, the fact that the public is very sensitive to these concerns about voluntary, involuntary, equity, uh, and so forth, uh, leads them to, to have reactions that experts often uh, cannot uh, understand, but you can't say the public is irrational for wanting to bring these other considerations uh, into the decision-making picture. Let me go through a few factors just to summarize why I think we're getting more concerned about risk uh, all the time, despite all the effort that's being done to, to reduce risk. Uh, first, uh, one factor is that we have greater ability to detect uh, minute amounts of, of uh, a chemical substance in our air or our food or our water. This is due to this great advances in analytic chemistry, so we can detect you know, one part per billion or even per trillion you know, molecules of, of these chemicals in, in, in substances. And once we detect them, and we know that at lar in large amounts they may cause cancer in, in laboratory animals, then the, the tougher question is, what does that mean uh, for the uh, you know, eating the food or breathing the air or drinking the water? Should we worry about it? That's a question that we can't answer quite so readily. Second, uh, the very fact that, that the technologies of today are new and unfamiliar makes us more concerned about them. It's natural to be concerned about things that you're, uh, you know, that you're not familiar with. And in fact, when the automobile and the steam engine were introduced uh, way back, people were, were frightened of them as well. Uh, but uh, you, know, you could see how automobiles and steam engines perform. And over time, we saw that they you know, were safe enough, and they gave us great benefits. And we got very, very used to them. And if anything, we've gotten uh, perhaps too used to the automobile. 
But if it's a chemical or radiation, we can't adjust to it so easily, especially if we're worried about harm that takes place, you know, uh, may take place uh, 20, 30, or 40 years in the future. We can't tell by our senses, you know, that this is really safe or not. We have to, uh, we have to rely on experts uh, and, and trust experts uh, in order to know if it's safe or not. The adaptation process seems to be much slower. Third, we've experienced uh, a fair number of serious uh, problems uh, uh, over the years, whether it's uh, nuclear accidents like Chernobyl or Three Mile Island or, or uh, chemical spills like at Bhopal or the Exxon oil spill and numerous other uh, Challenger accident and so forth and, and many other lesser kinds of events which, which certainly uh, show that there's a reality to, uh, to risk in, you know, in, in modern life. We, it's not all hypothetical. And when these events take place, they're surrounded by an immense amount of, of media coverage, uh, uh, you know, bringing us all the, all the gory details. And at, at the same time, we also have, uh, have a, uh, a rise in, in special interest groups, environmental groups and other interest groups, which if the media doesn't bring problems to our attention, these groups uh, bring problems to our attention that they think we need, we need to know about. So we are uh, being bombarded with information about the risks and problems of, of, uh, of today's life. Uh, another factor, as I alluded to earlier, is that the benefits from technology tend to be taken for granted, and when we see very little benefit from something, we're naturally uh, uh, not eager to take any, any risk, no matter how small. We're also being told more and more today that we have the ability through our lifestyle to control much of the risk that we, that we face. So we should watch our diet and exercise and so forth. Uh, and it may be that that uh, this will this makes us less tolerant of those risks that aren't under our control that are imposed upon us. So if someone's putting something in the water supply or the water is being contaminated uh, in a way uh, that uh, is uh, worrisome and we can't control that, we're less tolerant about it because we're told that we really should you know, we really are in control of so much. Uh, Finally, there may be real changes in the nature of, of today's risks. Uh, for example, may, many people believe there's greater potential for catastrophe today uh, uh, than in the past due to the uh, complexity and potency and interconnectedness of, of uh, technological systems and the widespread exposure of millions of people to new substances and technologies. Uh, so for example, the sweetener uh, aspartame, the NutraSweet, uh, came out a few years ago, was so widely uh, adapted that it's probably now ingested by close to a billion people every day. Now if there was something missed in the testing of, of this substance, uh, you know, as there was in the testing of the drug thalidomide a long time ago, but because the exposure is so great, the potential for, for problems uh, could be quite serious. I'm not saying that there was anything missed, but when you have that level of exposure, uh, the potential for catastrophe does, uh, does increase. Let me turn now, just lastly, to the issue of, of trust, which I've alluded to. Um, Chauncey Starr, who's one of the uh, pioneers in the nuclear industry, uh, spoke about this, this issue. And he, he, uh, he alluded to the, the uh, fact that we're very uh, unconcerned about um, having uh, zoos in the midst of large cities with wild animals such as tigers and lions, uh, very dangerous uh, animals. And, Somehow we've, we've uh, come to trust the, uh, the zookeepers and the structures that, that uh, uh, the barriers that exist, and uh, this is not a risk that, that anyone uh, really worries about. And in this light, he said that acceptance of risk is more dependent on public confidence in risk management than on quantitative estimates of risk. And I would agree with that very strongly. Uh, and one of the things we know about trust uh, that's very fundamental, uh, we all know it, uh, because it's so, so fundamental, is that trust is fragile. Uh, Abraham Lincoln once, uh, once wrote that uh, if you once forfeit the confidence of your fellow citizens, you can never regain their respect and esteem. Well, maybe the once and the never is a little bit too extreme. Uh, we sometimes give people a, a second chance. But there's something very important and fundamental about this, uh, this principle. And, uh, us academics have to give it a fancier term, so we call it the asymmetry principle of trust. And that's simply that it's, it's far easier to destroy trust than to create it. 
and there's some, some other things that go along with this, and that is that negative or trust-destroying events far outweigh positive events. They're more powerful. Uh, they're also more sharply defined. A negative event takes the place of something you can point at. It's a, you know, a lie or an accident or a betrayal of some sort. sort. Positive events, you know, the good things, are, tend to be uh, often fuzzy, uh, indistinct. So for example, how many, how many positive events, how many good things are represented by the safe operation of the uh, Trojan nuclear power plant for a single day? Is that one event? You know, is it dozens of events? It's undefined. When something's undefined, it tends to be kind of invisible. If something happened to Trojan, that would be a very, probably a very sharply defined event, which would have great, uh, great impact on us. Uh, following along this line, we also find that sources of bad news are judged more credible than sources of good news, and that um, uh, they also get more press coverage. There was a very interesting uh, article just recently about two stories that came, two, two research articles that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association in March having to do with radiation risk. One was a good news story. It was that some, something that was thought serious wasn't as bad as, as we thought. The other was a bad news story, that some other aspect of radiation exposure was worse than we thought. They came, they were adjacent stories in the, in the journal. And uh, someone tracked the, the media coverage that these two stories got. And the bad news story got about twice the, the coverage that the good news story, and much longer, longer stories. So we see now that, that the deck is stacked towards uh, creating uh, uh, distrust. Uh, I mean, it's easier to demonstrate risk in this world than it is to demonstrate safety. Going back to a nuclear power plant where the risks are rather you know, low, uh, and they're meant to be low, um, if a plant operates safely for a day or a year, does that mean it's safe, safe enough for our standards? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it's very hard to demonstrate safety, but if, if things go wrong, if there's management problems or other minor or, or major accidents, or if there's accidents in other nuclear plants around the country, uh, we take those, that as signals that the, that the risks are high. So risk is easier to demonstrate uh, than safety. Now, given all that I've said about this asymmetry of risk, <coughs> we now see uh, a new perspective on risk perception and, and risk uh, management. And here's where the politics and the system uh, come into play. Uh, the conflicts and controversies over risk decisions can be seen as a side effect of our um, rather remarkable form of participatory democracy, uh, amplified by dramatic technological and social changes. The technological change allows the electronic and print media to inform us of bad news, bad, or which is trust-destroying news, from all over the world as it happens. The social change uh, is the rise of powerful special interest groups who are well-funded by a fearful public and more and more sophisticated in using their own experts and the media to communicate their concerns to the public and to play a role in risk policy debates and decisions. A good example of that a few years ago was the, uh, the controversy over uh, uh, the growth hor hormone ALAR on apples in Washington State. And the Natural Resources Defense Council uh, did an analysis, which differed a little bit from the EPA's analysis, and concluded that this was uh, uh, dangerous to children and, and should be stopped. And they hired a public relations firm to uh, help them uh, get airtime. They were able to get Meryl Streep to, uh, to take their side and to appear on television uh, 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 promoting their, their views and so forth. Very sophisticated. Uh, uh, use of the media by this group to, to uh, advance their, their position. Now we have all of these changes uh, and so forth uh, blended within an adversarial legal system that pits expert against expert, contradicting each other's risk assessments and further destroying public trust. Uh, the science of risk assessment is, uh, is too young and too fragile to prevail in such a hostile atmosphere. Scientific analysis of risks cannot allay our fears of low probability catastrophes or delayed cancers unless we trust the system. In the absence of trust, science can only feed distrust by uncovering more bad news. 
uh, the failure of communication and education efforts uh, in this area can be understood as a corollary of the lack of trust. Without trust, no form of communication is likely to be effective. So if the study of risk perception now has not led to a solution to all our risk management problems, perhaps it's finally leading to a more adequate diagnosis of the root causes of risk conflicts. Uh, a diagnosis that forces us to confront the problem of trust as a key factor in understanding risk perception and risk conflicts has vast implications for how we approach risk management in the future. Creating and maintaining trust may require a degree of involvement with the public that goes far beyond uh, two-way communication uh, to encompass levels of public participation and power sharing that have rarely been attempted. In many situations, we may have to recognize that relationships are so poisoned that trust can't realistically be achieved in the short run. We may need to figure out ways to work constructively in domains where we can't assume that trust is, is attainable. The conflict over the uh, the proposed nuclear waste repository at Yucca Mountain, Nevada, is one such situation where we have analyzed and argued that the, that this, that the trust relationship between the Department of Energy and the federal government and the citizens of Nevada is so uh, uh, destroyed that there is no way that it can be uh, recovered or regained uh, under their current nuclear waste program. Therefore, there will be no uh, repository in Nevada uh, except if the federal government decides to put it there by force and to strip the states of its rights. Uh, and that has, uh, uh, that's an example of, of what happens when you fail to be sensitive to the, uh, the trust, uh, trust issues. Well, some may view this analysis as a depressing one. Uh, I don't. Uh, understanding the root causes of social conflict, I think, gives hope for improvement. Uh, it's far more depressing, in my view, to fail to understand the complicated psychological, social, cultural, and political forces that dictate uh, the successes and failures of risk management. So with that, I believe I'll stop and be glad to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Slovic. Our first question will be from our board host, uh, Susan Stone. Well, it's a political year, so I'll ask a political question. If you were the environmental president, what would your top priorities be? Oh, that's a t <laughs> well, I think that, that um, if you, you know, if you look at priorities uh, uh, around the, the nation environmentally, uh, I, mean, I think that uh, that poverty and the situations of uh, of uh, you know the urban areas, uh, the, the problems of uh, of health care and things like that, really uh, are the dominant uh, dominant social issues. Uh, this is not to put take anything away from our usual environmental concerns of. Uh, know, chemicals and radiation. I mean, they are, you know, important. Um, but uh, I think first things first, we should look at, uh, at what's going on, uh, uh, you know, in our cities and with our, with our economy, and that uh, that will have a great impact on health and safety uh, in this country. Uh, and then we can uh, turn to, to the environmental risk management. On the environmental side, I think that, uh, that I would take seriously what I've been saying about about the trust issues and think about ways to to bring the public uh, into into decision making uh, earlier and and uh, more legitimately. So it's not that we call people in later to kind of announce and defend what we're doing vis-a-vis -vis some environmental issue, but we we get them involved uh, early and we give them uh, real authority to to help us with these problems. Uh, and I think that's that's uh, one of the only ways to deal with the, the distrust issue. We have a question from our Business and Labor Standing Committee. Yes, we do. Leslie like Hildula. Mm -hmm. He's on vacation, too. Go ahead. Leslie Hildula with the Business and Labor Committee. Regarding trust, if I could express uh, perhaps a, a, a cynical feeling that maybe you could be reassuring about it, and that's the source of scientific analysis. 
and our ability to trust that. It seems to me that sometimes who pays and who profits, who's paying for the scientific analysis, who profits from their findings is not clearly stated and perhaps there's not a good source for unbiased scientific analysis in our country anymore. Well, I think that's a very uh, important question uh, regarding whether we can, we can trust science. Uh, I would like to, to treat it in two ways. Uh, it's not only the issue of whether you can trust it or not because of who's paying for it. I mean, that is, you know, that's something to think about, and we, of, we often think about that. But there's something more fundamental that's a problem, and that is with regard to, to risk from chemicals or risk from uh, complex systems like nuclear reactors or systems that have to be safe for thousands of years, like a nuclear waste repository. And, and that is that science doesn't have all the answers that we would want them to have. That the, that the science uh, is limited uh, itself. I mean, how do we find out about the risk from chemicals? Uh, we've, got, we've developed the science of toxicology and epidemiology and, and some related sciences. We put uh, huge amounts of money every year into doing toxicological studies. We, you know, we take large groups of, of, of rats and mice and other animals and we, we dose them at high doses with, with chemicals and we watch what happens and we try to predict what that means for humans uh, exposed to much smaller amounts of these chemicals for much longer periods of time in the context of many other chemicals that the animals weren't uh, exposed to. And that's a very clumsy, indirect science. We don't, we don't know enough about the mechanisms whereby molecules of a chemical interact with, with the molecules of the body to cause different kinds of harm. And lacking that kind of mechanistic knowledge we have to rely on these very, these very crude animal studies, which are subject to great uh, debate and, and conflict in the adversarial arena that we work out these issues. So I would say that part of the picture is that the science is weak. Then you can you know, also get into the issues that uh, in the adversarial arena, we, you know, we, we hire you know, experts on all sides and, and uh, expect them to say things that that uh, support uh, the side that is, uh, is paying their, their salary, and that certainly uh, uh, occurs, and we find that the, that the experts are contradicting each other, and when, when the public sees experts arguing on both sides of the issue, they have to throw up their hands and wonder, you know, well, does anyone know what's going on here, you know, who can we trust? So, yes, what you say is a problem, and it's, uh, it's augmented, really, uh, by the fact that the science is, uh, is often inadequate to begin with. We'll now go to questions from City Club members uh, from the floor. As Bill S. used to say, just remind those of you who are going to ask questions at the end in a question mark. Thank you. Uh, Professor, I'm Greg Pifori. Uh There's no one in line behind me. My question is a little longer than usual. I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, you have spoken of the nuclear power industry's failure to be sensitive to trust issues. I'd like to describe three events just from the last week, which I'd like you to comment on. First, we learned that at Hanford, the government now no longer even pretends that it can assure us that the waste tanks will not explode. A computation of the amount of waste involved leads readily to the conclusion that if they went, we would not simply be talking about evacuating Portland, but in all likelihood abandoning our city. It was announced this week that in Yucca Mountain, where the Department of Energy had assured us the nuclear waste site would be safe for 10,000 years or longer because there was no possibility of an earthquake, there was in fact just an earthquake the other day, 5-6 on the Richter scale, epicenter Yucca Mountain, causing more than a million dollars in damage to the few structures that are there. And at Trojan this week, it was announced the plant was closing because a feed water pump in the reactor had failed. And the enterprising reporter said, isn't it a fact that the backup pump also failed? And PGE went back and did some more checking and finally acknowledged that, that was true. Aren't we really dealing here 
in the public's broken trust with the nuclear industry, not simply in some failure of sensitivity, but in a 40-year pattern and a one-week pattern of lying. Well, <clears throat> I think that, uh, that your point illustrates a number of, of things that uh, relate to my, to my talk. First, there, there are incidents occurring uh, all over the world in nuclear power, nuclear waste. Uh, I mean, there are hundreds of reactors operating around the world. Uh, France has you know, gone completely or 70 percent nuclear uh, in its energy production. Uh, uh, you know, it's a large industry, and there's a lot happening. And when things uh, when things go wrong, we manage to uh, to hear about you know a high percentage of uh, of the problems that uh, uh, that go wrong. I wouldn't say it's so much lying or secrecy. I mean, there has been a lot of secrecy, but we certainly are aware of a lot of a lot of problems. And uh, an industry like the nuclear industry is is held accountable to things that go on not only you know in its own backyard here or a particular plant, but all over the world. You know, an accident or a problem anywhere is a problem everywhere. And these, these incidents, like the ones you describe, uh, uh, you know, hurt the trust greatly. Uh, you know, certainly the, the, the mismanagement of the waste at all the defense reactor sites around the country, not just Hanford, but Rocky Flats and Savannah River and Fernald and, and West Valley. I mean, the names are familiar to us because, because for 30 or 40 years, you know, there have been severe problems noted that keep getting getting worse. And I mean, that's a legacy. That's a legacy that is going to be hard. Hard. I don't. I think it's impossible for the industry to to live down in the in the near term, uh, especially given what we were talking about about trust. So. Uh, I mean, these are real these are real problems for the industry. On the other hand, the, uh, many people say that uh, you know, look at the number of accidents in the in industry. We generate a lot of power. You know, how many accidents, uh, killing people, have there been? Uh, not not uh, not many, or or even any uh, directly. Look at the the risks from fossil fuels. Look at the risks from generating energy with hydroelectric power. Uh, you know, there's no uh, risk-free source of energy. Uh, so I think we're going to have some very tough choices ahead of us, especially if we keep, you know, allowing the population to, to grow and demands on energy to, to keep up. Uh, you know, where are we going to get that energy from and uh, in a way that is uh, acceptable to us uh, from a public health and environmental safety standpoint? Uh, these are going to be real tough, tough questions. And I guess I would say that uh, I don't think the nuclear industry is going to be very able to overcome these kind of adverse events. Uh, uh, in this adversarial world that we have, you know, uh, uh, those events can destroy trust a lot uh, better than good performance on the part of the industry can build trust. So I'd say that the nuclear industry is is going to continue to uh, uh, to be besieged for the foreseeable future. Uh, Ralph Crawshaw, City Club member, also with Oregon Health Decisions. Uh, Dr. Slovak, you outlined a number of processes of mistrust that are, sound like they're accelerating. Would you speak, if you can, to any elements within our culture that would be trust nurturing, that we could look to as in a civic or institutional way over a, over a period of time to step above and beyond the confrontational courtroom approach? Well, <clears throat> it's obviously an, an important uh, question, and I feel less able to point to things that can that can uh, uh, create trust in this kind of uh, situation. Uh, one of the, we have a research project on on this topic, and we hope to to learn this. But uh, I would say that that one of the things that comes through in this in this work is that uh, uh, that women are more trusted. Uh, than men, and that, uh, and that industries and activities which are seen as more uh, open and uh, and accessible and oriented towards women are trusted more than than uh, than uh, industries and activities and professions that are are male dominated. And maybe we're going to see uh, 
you know, rise of uh, women in politics for this very, uh, very reason. Uh, but uh, I would say probably power sharing at this point uh, that, you know, we, we seem to be having trouble with the model of, of authority that says, you know, we've got the experts on one side, they have the answers, and, and you've got your elected representatives, and let them confer with the experts and decide what's best for us. We seem less willing to, uh, uh, to do that now because of these, you know, our trust is, has, has been betrayed, and we want to get into the act. Uh, we've got a society that, uh, you know, that gives people more and more capability and, and avenues for intervention than virtually any other society, and I guess we're going to see that exercised uh, over, the, over the future, and, and we're going to have to be tolerant. If you're, you know, in, in business or industry, I think you're going to have to be tolerant of the fact that you're going to have, uh, have to bring in the public, uh, you know, uh, to the table and, and uh, early on and get them involved and have them participate and buy in and maybe have even authority to, you know, to shut you down or kick you out if they don't like what you're doing. It's not necessarily an efficient way to do business, but uh, it may be the only way to, to deal with this uh, trust issue. Ray Polanyi, City Club member. Uh, Dr. Slavik, I think you mentioned that one of the things that is necessary, of course, is citizens' participation. And it seems like in the last uh, 10 to 15, 20 years, there has been an increase in citizens' participation. Uh, some of it mandated by federal legislation in, in situations. Uh, and initially, it, it was taken as, as a serious citizens' participation, and, and I think from the part of the citizens, that was a feeling that they were listened to and, and uh, that, that their conclusions were adopted, perhaps, and followed. But eventually, I think the name, that the game seemed to shift, and uh, Citizens Advisories Committee be became more of an orchestrated type of thing, where, where the people that would participate were chosen, uh, and, and the result was somewhat uh, predetermined. And if, by any chance, it did not work out that way, uh, it was disregarded. So. Uh, I think there's a lot of skepticism around about what the extent of citizens' involvement, the kind of citizens' involvement, and the attention paid to the citizens' involvement. How do you feel about that? Well, I would agree with you that uh, that it's often a perfunctory kind of thing. That you know, it's in the it's in the rules and regulation. We have to have a public hearing. Let's do it. Let's get it over with, and then let's get on with our our business. And uh, that. If it's done that way, uh, it's very easy for the public to recognize that that's what's going on, that they're just going through the motions, and it's not, it doesn't serve the, you know, the, the broader purpose of, uh, of uh, dealing with the, you know, the, the trust issues. So uh, to the, you know, if we keep doing that, nothing's going to change. Uh, we have time for one last very quick question. Vivian Solomon, City Club member. In the adversarial context, whether it's in the courtroom or in deciding how to vote on a ballot issue, when the public is presented with experts who do disagree and the public must choose one or the other, what factors are most persuasive in breaking the deadlock and causing the public to choose one expert over the other? I think when, th when that happens, people rely on more fundamental uh, <clears throat> world views or ideologies that they hold. Uh, some people uh, tend to believe that the, you know, that the earth is uh, uh, abundant in resources and very robust and it's meant to be you know, uh, used for, by humans for their welfare and other people believe that the earth is fragile and, and uh, limited and uh, uh, on the verge of, of destruction and that's one type of general orientation that people have to the world and that will lead them to choose sides. Or I guess what I'm saying is that there'll be personality and political factors uh, that will lead them to side with one, one expert or another. Uh, and uh, you know, it won't resolve on the science because the science and the technical issues are being shown to be in dispute and conflict and you can't work that through. So you, you, know, you either, you know, if you're, if you're pro-industry or pro-business, you'll go with, with that expert. If you're pro-something um, else, you'll go with the other expert. Uh, that's the way you'll decide it. It's a 
about 1.15, uh, I think it's customary to often comment that these are thought-provoking sessions. Uh, it strikes me that this is very much the case today. This is a subject matter we've all probably thought about in bits and pieces, but it's uh, a very interesting uh, uh, way to think about it. So I hope we appreciate your comments. Uh, we'll see you next week. We're adjourned. <laughs>